Dan's just showing you the excellent leg clip system, the way he changes it with a quick link. That's the first time I've ever used it, and there's two carp in the net as a result. Both on, within a couple of minutes of each other. One's a PB, the other one's a mid-30. I'm ecstatic. Come on. Look at that. 55 pounds, 15 ounces, a new PB from Piraway. Absolutely superb. Dan's lead system has done the business for me. First time I've ever used it. Really made up with that. Coupled with the uh, hybrid soft and the curve hook, a deadly combination. This fish certainly agreed. Awesome. Here we are, 34 pound of maisel carp, caught right out the edge, about half a rod length from the bank, just down the margins from behind me here. It's caught on a little fish meal boily with a little bit of plastic corn on the top. Beautiful fish, fought well, right under the rod tips, all exciting stuff. Anyway, I know Dan's hovering in the background, so I should get this fish back and then we can talk a little bit about rig camouflage. We're in Simon's swim. Well, it's not actually really a swim, is it, mate? It's a, it's a little gap in between. Poke hole. A poke hole, yes. <laughs> um, very well done on the fish. Thank you very much, very sir. Very well done. It must have been nice to get one at close quarters. Yeah, dead chuff, dead chuff. Um, I know this is the sort of fishing that you love to do all the time, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but beforehand, I'd, uh, probably everybody watching here doesn't actually know what you do for a living and know how... Um, involved you are in in the carp industry the carp as it thing. yeah so t t tell us what you do for a living and what that involves and my primary job I, I teach at Sparshot College in Hampshire right. uh, I teach fish farming and fishery management uh, so I'm a specialist in sort of still water fishery management carp fishery management right uh, and I'm also a carp farmer so I have a right. bit of contact with carp day to day right. and, and and what have you had to study to get to that to be uh, able to I, lecture in those things. Uh, many, many moons ago, I went to Sparshalt and did what would now be a degree course, and then right. I've done a master's degree in applied fish biology. So. Right, OK. <laughs> Fished so, out. <laughs> so, yeah, so you're fairly well, you're fairly well qualified to um, discuss what carp can see and what they can't see. And, oh, I can certainly, uh, certainly talk carp, yeah. <laughs> right, OK. So, so, because so, I don't know, yeah, yeah and, and I see things written in magazines and stuff, but I've never really read into it. So what can and can't a carp see? A okay, carp, it's a good question. They, they've got very good vision, primarily, so that's very important to understand that they're, they're not blurry, out of focus. They've got very good vision, and it's right. colour vision as well. Right. Um, so they, it's safe to say they've got very good colour vision. What they haven't got um, is an ability to see out of the water. So if you take them out right. of the water, they become quite short-sighted. Oh, right, okay. In the I water, they've got very good vision. Right. Um, and underwater, their eyes have evolved to be able to see slightly better than us in lower light levels. Right, so where okay. we might think, oh, it's nearly dark, for the carp, that's actually natural light because right. obviously they've evolved under the water. Right, because that's a, a big thing people say to me at exhibitions is, oh, I've seen your underwater films and my lake's nowhere near as clear as yours, so camouflage doesn't really matter. Yeah. What, what's your view on on that side of things? Uh, I think you, I always approach everything thinking, I always take the carp that can see absolutely everything right. and then try and pitch it at that angle because then you may be over the top, but it's better to be over the top than them spook off a very exactly. obvious setup. Right. So yeah, even in, I mean, the water we've got here is fairly coloured, but yep. I, so I still want to have everything pinned to the floor. I not want to risk it. Right. I mean, I always think, yeah, it, it, you know, the water might be murky. You can't see the bottom in two foot, but that fish is that far away. Yeah. From, from what it's about to eat. Mm. So, I mean, is, is, that, is that the case? Can, can, you know, if it's a very short distance, are they still able to pick out? Oh yeah, I think they're seeing, when they're close to the bottom, and they are, they've got good vision. I mean, right. I'm using the, the rig that I had the fish on, it's tipped with a bit of plastic corn. I haven't put that on there because I wanted a bit of plastic on the top. I wanted it to be a visual stimulant, you know, right. stimulant for the fish. So it's giving him something to home in on. Right. A little okay. bit of bait on the bottom. In he comes, oh, there's a bit. Right. Flat. So a little a little sight bob, as it were, yeah. something just something. to draw him into. I'm here. <laughs> right. Okay. But I, I've, when I've played about in tanks uh, at the college, I've I've actually had fish pick up. I I cut the shank of a hook, and just put the eye and the straight shank of a size six hook in, mm. and the fish in the tank. So no no point, nothing dangerous, no yeah. line. I put that in, and the fish were well, sand on the bottom of the tank. The fish kept picking it up. Right. And they would swim up to it and pick it up. They were only two pounders, right. but they were clearly seeing that on the sand and thinking, that is something on the sand. Right. So they I'll can see hooks. That's, so they that's, can that's see the point. an eye and a shank without a bend, without right. a point. Right, OK. So that's they can see good that. Bear vision. OK, it's on the sandy bottom and maybe it was contrasting, but that gives you an idea of the level right. of vision they've got. Right, okay. They weren't sort of feeling around for it. It was straight to it and it went. Right. Out it went. Right, OK. That's very interesting because I mean, it's something I've paid a lot of attention to. Oh. Oh. I nearly had the situation of striking the wrong rod, but uh, yeah, that was definitely 
an inquiry. Right, we've got 10 minutes before our uh, our next feed <laughs> up at the lodge. Okay, we've got 10 minutes to catch one. You've got 10 minutes to catch one. So, excuse I'll, me if I have to bomb off. That's now. all right, no problem, no problem. So, I, I, I've always paid a lot of attention to camouflage. You know, I've always dropped rigs in the mm. edge and tried to blend them in, even before coating powders and yeah. everything. I used to paint the leads and, yeah. you know. Um, so you still think that that is, you know, that will make a difference to how many pe how many fish people catch, whatever the water that they fish. I think if you get the, a really, I call it chicken soup water, yep. farm pond, clay ponds, a really chocolate colour. I think the carp feeding in three or four foot have probably got very very little vision. Right, They're okay. using their other senses, but in your average, if you take your average carp fishery, yeah, I think you've got to assume that the fish are seeing the bottom right. while they're feeding, and if you camouflage things, you are going to get more bites. Right, and do you do you break the colours up? Do you have some Something that matches as close as it can the bottom of the lake, yeah. it, all the way through it, or what? Yeah, what pretty do you much. Do? I use putty on the main line, get everything down low, right. uh, try and match up the leads, try and match up the hook links, right. so that everything it blends with the bottom. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, any if you put a rig in the margin, anything that catches your eye, yep. is going to catch the carp's eye. So if it's a glinting swivel, a shiny hook, you know, a bright, right. a bright, you know, little swivel that, that, that it's, it's rubbed, the coat yeah. is rubbed off, and it's really glinting in the sunlight. Yep. It's going to be the same on the bottom of the pond. Right, so the fish okay. is going to go, oh, what's that? Right. So if, if, if a rig is worn and people can see the, the, the glint coming through, yeah. change those metal items. Yeah. Nothing, nothing should glint or shine. Because right. obviously to a fish, it's going to be like, whoa. Right. The last time I saw that, I was. Right. <laughs> it, does, it, it sort of confirms that I think a lot of the time people catch fish in spite of what they're doing rather than because of it. You mm. see things on there that are glinting and everything else. Because I've seen it on the underwater films, all the stuff that we were, now do has got non-reflective finishes yeah. on it as best we can no, I th I th under, yeah, you know, under manufacturing sort of you know, um, restrictions or whatever, or, or limitations. Yeah. You can't have things exactly how you'd want them to be, but you do them as well as you can. Um, and it's nice to know that the effort that we're putting in probably is actually doing something. Oh, absolutely. You know? I think when I just think back to those fish taking that, the eye and the shank of that hook in the tank, if yeah. they can see it that clearly, then you've got to do everything you can, right. humanly possible, right. to blend so in. Let me let me talk about this example. I've fished a lake where I've been fishing a silty spot, a gravelly spot, and a weedy spot, and I've had three completely different coloured rigs on mm. to suit those three spots. Do you, is that the sort of thing that you would do as well? Or yeah, or I, I, yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. If I if, if I, you can. if I can, yeah. If I I'd say a lot of the spots I fish. As you know, a, a sort of short range, yes. you know, clear gravel pit margin fishing. So right. I can see exactly what I'm putting my, my tackle down on and obviously right. match it up quite easily. Right, okay. And hook link wise, do you, well, in those sort of situations, do you, do you prefer a mono hook link, a braided hook link, a coated hook link? What's your preference? Um, I've been using a, your uh, soft coated braid here, right. um, which I've been getting on with well. That fish I've had today was on that. Right, um, that's the hybrid soft. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Right, okay. Um, so I say I've not used it until this week, and I've played about with it, and uh, yeah, well, right. caught a few on this, so I'm chuffed with that. But um, in, a, in a clear water situation, if you are dropping it in onto that gravel spot, I, oft should... I often use really supple braid. Right, um, and why is that? Just because it takes the contours of the bottom. Right, I can okay. put quite a lot of putty along and get it right flat on the floor. Anything with a bit of wiriness, particularly on gravel tends to sit up, you yes. don't get it lying flat. I want it absolutely on the floor. Right. Um, I've played about with nylon and fluorocarbons again, but on gravel I don't, I'm not very happy with the way they sit. You yes. Take, you just take one stone and they absolutely. So absolutely. I want, I want it to contour the bottom. Yeah. Um, but if it's silty, then I, you know, I'm happy with nylon or a fluorocarbon, something a bit right. stiffer. Right, okay. Okay, that's cool. And what about at night? I mean, how much can a carp see at night? <laughs> Well, good question. I don't know, but we know that their eyes have evolved for lower light levels than ours, so it's safe to assume that you know they can see some in clearer water. They can see some degree of detail on the substrate on the bottom right. of the lake. So you know, a white pop up. I've caught them on little bits of white plastic on the bottom with no freebie. Right. So what was that? It wasn't smell. No. They must have seen it. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, there must be some sight involved. Right. Yeah. And do you think at night? It, it, it helps us that rigs are harder to see for the fish at night. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. 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 Right. So and I, I often hear people say to me, well, when you're margin fishing, you're, you're fishing in the shallowest, clearest bit of the lake and the fish are rigged. That's so it becomes very, very intense with them seeing you, seeing yeah. the rigs and stuff like that. Right. And if you're chucked out in the middle, you get more bites. But it's right. not as exciting. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and what about mainline? I mean, are, are, you, are you one for keeping things slack do you fish tight lines yeah. what what no, what's I, your I, preference I, a preference is definitely slack lines but right. particularly in close like this i've got the bobbins down low i like everything lying on the floor right so i'm playing about with uh, 
and a 12 pound fluorocarbon on the reels right. here and it, it's going down on the floor yeah flat along the bottom and that's yeah. that's it's great like. for that sort of fishing because you can pay some off yeah, of the reel just, can't down you? it goes down like it a rock. goes Thunk. right so no back leads in this situation oh, yeah, i've got back leads on as well as well yes right okay only because i've i've uh, heard from the guys fishing here previously and people with experience on the lakes these fish and i know now having walked around there very pressured fish uh, you know it's a it's a sort of day ticket style fish where you've got lots of anglers on it's a busy lake they're always yeah. seeing bait they're always seeing pressure they are going to be swimming around looking out for trouble looking right. out for oiks like us to <laughs> <laughs> so everything needs to be flat on the floor so i've right. got uh, yeah i have paid off line the fluorocarbon's gone down i've got a bat lead on there as well right so everything's well down on the floor right okay. i don't want to catch you know yeah. Pick up the pins of a 45 pounder. <laughs> be a shame. Right. I want to well, land him. It's, it is nice to hear from from an official expert on carp. <laughs> <Official>. that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, um, Danny. Very sweet of um, you to say you know, so. That, that what they can and can't see, and how much mm. importance you put on it. Yeah. Hopefully, it will inspire everybody else to put a bit more importance into the camouflage of their stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah at the end of the day, they can get three or four colours of everything now. Yeah, Dan, so I think, you know, to conclude, for your average punter on the bank who's going for a weekend, maybe a Saturday night's fishing once a month. He thinks, well, maybe it's not worth it. Well, I think, yeah, definitely. If he can, if he can camouflage his lead, camouflage his hook, and get everything pinned to the bottom, get his line down, it's going to make a difference to his catch right over the course of the season. For sure. Excellent, excellent. Well, it's nice to hear from an expert that rig camouflage is vitally important. He puts a lot of attention onto it. We've put a lot of attention onto it over the last few years. And if you follow the say so concept and match your bits to the lake bed, you will get more bites. Oh, look at this absolute cracker, 41 and a half pounds of Maison Magic, caught on a quarter soft coated hook link and a size six curved shank hook. Dead chuff for this one, beautiful fish. Definitely time to get him back in the pond. Well, while Danny's inflicting some long range action on Jolly Lake, I've joined Mr. Half Carp, Half Human, <laughs> Simon Scott to talk rigs because I think everyone at home would be dying to find out your thoughts about rigs based on your fish science experience so here i am let's have a look at this first one mate it looks uh it looks pretty pretty good um, thank you ali what's the material uh that is a hybrid soft coated braid which i've not used much to be honest i've uh, probably only been using it for a couple of weeks three weeks now mm -hmm. and uh, yeah i really really work getting on well with it well you know i've uh, i've got a nylon fan i'm also a braid fan and i find right. that the old hybrid soft coated braid it does it's a bit of both you know you, you've got the the anti-tangle effect of nylon in, in the coated section and then the braid does the bit, you know, the turning I like at the end. So. Okay, okay, well, it's, um, I can see it's incorporating the new the new curve hook, but the first thing that, that I notice when I look at your rigs is the, the, there's a lovely bit of separation between the bend of the hook and the start of the bait. Now, firstly, what, why do you have that separation? That's really important because when that, that that's a double bottom bait, two little barrels, when I, the fish sucks that in, mm -hmm. I want that separation. It, it gives the, the rig room to work. Those baits have got to drag the, the bend of that hook over, turn it over fast and flip it over so that it's an aggressive setup. And if you have the baits too close mm -hmm. to the bend of the hook there, it doesn't turn as effectively. It's like a block, isn't yeah, it? It stops the bend exactly. from working. Yeah, it gets yeah. in the way of the rig mechanics. So it, you need to have, as you say, I've got about a centimetre there, and that works well. Right, nice. Um, well, just just looking up it now, we, we've then got the silicon. Yeah. Um, reason for that? A very important part of the rig. Um, I've used rings in the past, but mm -hmm. I'm currently quite a fan of the silicon setup because I think it actually is more effective than the, uh, the rings. And also, it's a ring tends to glint. You know, it's one less thing to glint and catch a carp size. Yeah. So I've, I've tended to use the silicon, um, and it's really important to have it coming off down there at the, at the back of the the, the point, yeah. um, because that's what helps to turn the hook over quickly. Yeah. It's a bottom bait, so yeah. putting them there, yeah. it's adding to the the yeah, weight of the exactly. bend. So as that, as the, as that bait moves along the floor of the fish's mouth, that yeah. rig will f f flip over nice and quickly. So it should be, if it works well, an aggressive setup. Right, excellent. Well, what, while we're on that, just just talk us through how you set the, the set the system up itself. Okay, the first thing I do is get about uh, maybe 18 inches of hybrid soft coated braid off the spool, yeah, uh, and strip back about six inches. So you know this sort of length. Yeah. Uh, then I tie my loop on the end. I tend to tie quite a decent sized loop. I like the knot of the loop to be within the second bait if I'm using a little double barrel bottom bait like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so it holds the two baits together. Yeah. Um, and then. A bit of a bleat there. Come on, bleep. fish. That would be good timing, wouldn't it? It mate? would be great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Go on. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, God. <laughs> 
Uh, let's hope the cart god is smiling right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, so where were we? So I've, I've, I've stripped off a bit of the coating. I tie my loop. I like it to be quite a decent sized loop. Uh, and then the next job is to, is to get that bit of uh, silicon onto the hook, which yeah. is a fiddly business. You've got to thread it down over the, uh, over the point, round and up onto the straight section of the shank. Okay. And that's when you use your little sewing needle. Right. And you, you thread that very carefully. You've got to be really careful, with, obviously, with your fingers. You know, jab yourself. And you thread that, the, the, the needle, between the silicon and the hook. Yep. Thread it down, then push your braid through, and then pull it on and okay. pull it through. Lovely. Uh, and then I slide the silicon down into position. Okay. And that then dictates, I can dictate the length of the hair at that point. Yep. Um, okay. So that's when you fine tune the length of the hair. The braid then follows round the, the shank of the hook. Uh, to the eye and then I do a, a knotless knot and yeah. normally five six turns the, the, the nice thing about this setup is that if you've stripped a bit too much you can extra put an extra turn on on your knotless knot yeah. to, to lose a little bit yeah exactly of, of that braided section I like the braided section to be a centimeter to a centimeter and a half extending beyond that, that's that bit, yeah. isn't it yeah just and we've got two, just over yeah. a centimeter there and that's, okay. that's beyond the length of the uh, shrink tube so that's helping the hook to, to drop down giving a yeah, pivot it, point it's fl flexibility yeah. uh, mobility and it helps it to flip over okay and then onto the shrink tube yeah a little bit of shrink tube again about probably just over a centimeter All right. uh, once once i've done my knotless knot then I, I thread the shrink tube down and position it and i like to position it so it's just covering the turns of the knotless knot uh, gives that a bit of protection possibly a bit of strength um, and then um, and then to come off off the shank of the hook okay and then uh, moving down, we've then got we've got the link loop on the end. How, how do you tie that on? Uh, I'd use a Palomar to tie that on. I generally, Ali, what I, I do is I tie up several and I don't tie a link loop on them. Okay. I leave them uh, in my rig bin without a loop on them. Yeah. Um, and then de depending on the fishing situation, if it's real clean gravel, I might go shorter. If it's a bit mucky on the bottom, I go a bit longer. Okay. Uh, and then I tie the link loop on with a Palomar. It's a bit of a fiddly process. You've got to tease it down, but the, that uh, soft-coated braid, does tie a really strong Palomar knot. It, yeah. You just a bit of patience when you tie it down. It, you can see on here. It ties yeah, it, yeah. Ties I noticed nice you, you you put the um, needle through the knot as well before you put locking yeah. it down. It's really important just to tease it out. And people yeah. that haven't tied a lot of Palomar knots, particularly with a little bit of a fiddly um, uh, material like that, it's quite important to tease it down to get it to bed down. So evenly. I tease yeah. it up the up the hook link a bit. Get it wet and then slide it back down and use the needle just to tease all the all the loops down together so yeah. they run parallel around the link. All flush, yeah. all looking good. Yeah, really yeah, warm. gotcha. Um, now we're going to move on to the next rig. Yeah. Okay. But one of the important things that I want to talk about is is rig length. But yeah. but let's let's look at the next one. Um, material mechanics, sort of why and when. Okay. Well, okay. it's um, it's the Supernatural uh, braid, which I'm a great braid fan, particularly stalking. I use braid a lot. Right. Uh, and normally sort of four to six inch hook links um, and braid suits me perfectly because I'm often when I'm stalking I'm positioning rigs on spots where I can see clearly on the bottom you know as, as clear as yeah. the gravel in this swim you know, can see the spot yeah. you know where the fish is feeding and I've got you know I've got position within that spot that I want to put my rig and I know I wanted to lay and I like the braid because it, it enables me to do that it's that the aura supernatural braid hugs the bottom beautifully Right. It's also green, so it's a sort of very natural colour within the swim. Yeah. It's that sort of weedy green colour, so it's absolutely yeah. perfect. Yeah, there's the gravel brown one yeah. as well, yeah. but I suppose for, for a lot of your fishing yeah, on these often, low stock you know, lakes, there's, there's... You know, there's even if you've got a bit of gravel on the bottom, there's a bit of weed kicking about, there are weedy waters, so yeah. that sort of light greeny colour blends beautifully with the bottom. I gotcha, It doesn't gotcha. get the fish's suspicion up. Um, notice that this is slightly different with regards to mechanics. You've got the, um, the hair coming out the back of the eye yeah, this time. Right. Um, Talk us through why and how you tie this one up. Again, a, a rig is very similar to the first one, as you touched on. The, the difference being that I don't have the bit of silicon there. That this, that's a very um, adaptable rig. I can use that, possibly tip that with a little bit of sweet corn. You know, the old plastic corn floating. Yeah, to give it a little bit of buoyancy. And I like that with that setup. It, it tends to just lift the uh, the eye of the hook up, so that helps with the old rig mechanics. Okay. On that one. Uh, it's a very effective setup. I've caught a lot of fish on that with bottom baits as well as slimy buoyant. So, yeah, yeah, yep. And then uh, looking up it, you got you obviously got the hair, and then looks like the old liner liner. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the liner liner. Come yeah, from that, the old school era of Jim Gibson. Jim Gibson, eat yeah. your heart out. Yeah, uh, it's a devastatingly effective setup. Um, it doesn't work so well if you're using little sticks. I found, okay. and that's one of the uh, one of the reasons with the other rig that I've tied there. I, I've had it coming straight out of the bottom of the rig tube. Right. Uh, so that comes, when you pull that into your stick, it goes into the stick really nicely. So if you use right. the liner line and you pull it into the stick, sometimes I find it gets caught up and it doesn't sit as well. So I, I prefer to use the liner liner. 
like that setup we've got here if I was maybe stalking and placing a bait without using a stick. Okay, okay. And then um, running down it, again, I, I presume you just steam that down. Yeah, that's right. And then down yeah. to the, uh, d- so you've got the, the ring swivel. Sort of uh, 15 centimetres, six inch hook link there and down to a ring ring swivel as you say. Okay. Uh, and that would be, if I had to go anywhere, that would be the sort of setup, you know, I'd probably take both those rigs. I'd be confident in most fishing situations that yeah. between the two of them, I've got something that I could catch a fish with. Well, you've certainly, you certainly caught a few, mate. And then lead system wise, I've noticed this week, especially because it's the first time I've had a chance to sort of fish with you. Um, very simple lead system. It's yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, flattened inline pairs. Yeah. Uh, I like the bolt effect that they give you. Uh, yeah. Threes, fours. If I'm stalking right on the edge, maybe four, fours, maybe even bigger. Yeah. Uh, if I'm casting out, I'm not a great fan of boshing out big leads. Uh, so yeah. something like a three. So um, that's that's just basically safe zone leader. Yeah, that's right. Shock yeah. leader sleeve inside yeah. inside yeah, like there. Those. Yeah. And then obviously you've tapped the insert out of the lead yeah, and pushed right. that over there. Yeah. So just a very very simple inline that I suppose it's it, it's kind of like how a lot of us started really. Yeah. You've carried on using it. Yeah. No, I find I I think that. You can get yourself completely and utterly in a tangle over rigs and lead set up and you know, location is vitally important to me. I spend more time worrying about that than, than the rigs. I'm confident that with that setup, if I get in front of feeding fish and put it on the right spot, I'm going to catch them. Now, a question I was dying to ask you was, from, from all the fish you've studied and all the things you've seen at Sparsholt, do you see carp feed from different lengths? O- off the bottom, basically, you know? I'm, I'm not a great fan of the belief that carp sort of suck things up from three or four inches away. I, they, when I watch them feed, they tend to come pretty close to the food item and then suck it in. Right. Okay. I think that's, uh, so, so is I mean, there when, they, when, they, when they're drawing bait off the bottom, if they're sucking bait, off, obviously bits of bait that are three or four inches away might move towards the mouth. But I think their intended target's normally a bit closer than that. So they're generally they're generally hoovering. Yeah. Right. The, the other question I have. Does that now mean that whenever you tie a rig, there's an optimum length that you would that would, you'd ever go up to? Is there a, like a maximum you'd ever use? No, I've I've caught fish on long hook lengths, like 18 inch hook lengths before, so I'm, I'm not different situations, baiting situations, for example. It, I think if you're if you're perhaps as you know, Dan is obviously a great fan of sort of spob mix, putting quite a lot of uh, small food items in a swim. In those situations where fish are hoovering very close to the bottom, very slowly as very well, very slowly, yeah. then they become, I think, much harder to catch. Definitely. So very short yeah, hook yeah, yeah. that's very effective wallop, turns over quick. They hit the lead yeah, quick. As soon as they yeah. suck it up, whap. Right. Um, I think if, you've, if you're spraying boilies out over a swim, then the carp tend to be swimming between boilie to boilie to boilie. You get more movement than exactly. a longer hook link. Um, short hook links are all well and good, you know, in Dan's situation, but if the bottom's a bit mucky and stuff, then you're not going to get the presentation right. So you've kind of got a bit of a, bit of a balance. Yeah, there. I suppose you need to then take into account your lead system and yeah. how much hook link's going to stick out yeah, on the exactly. bottom once it's gone in, etc., yeah, exactly. etc. Et well, that's fascinating me. I mean, that was the biggest thing I wanted to find out is whether, because it's always been a bit of a myth that carp mm. sometimes suck up from a different length, but you know, yeah, you, I'm, I, I think it, yeah. I'm sure they do suck bait in from three or four inches away, but it's it's not what they're actually aiming to suck up. Okay, so um, th- so to recap, your, your length is provisionally dictated by the type of bottom you're fishing on, mm. and then ultimately by your baiting situation. Yeah, and also to an extent, what other anglers are doing around the lake. If everyone's fishing with eight to ten inch hook links, then maybe yeah. go very short or a bit longer. You know, they okay. they learn through association, and if every rig they pick up is one length. They, they learn to deal with it. They learn to deal with it. So do something longer or shorter to try and throw them. Right. Uh, and the same applies with hook size, bait size, everything. If, if there's a big pattern on a lay, everyone's doing the same thing, then try and be trying to do something different. Obviously, fish one rod the same as everyone else, just in case <laughs> it really works well. Bandwagon rod. Yeah. You're bandwagon. Yeah, on the bandwagon, but then try something a little bit different to see if you can't create your own uh, line mate. of attack. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, there we have it. Simon Scott, half carp, half man, giving us an inroad <laughs> into, uh, into his rig thinking. And there we have it, 30 pounds, two ounces, well chuffed with this one, taken off the corner of the island on the KD rig, curved hook, and a bit of hybrid soft with two grains of plastic corn over the top of that all important spod mix. And as usual, I've got a PVA stick on the end with my favorite little stick mix, and that's what we're gonna show you right now. We're gonna go into all the ingredients, exactly how to knock it up, and show you the brand new long chuck funnel web system that we've just updated. 
We're going to talk stick mixes now. So uh, I've got Gaz with me. Um, so you show me yours, I'll show you mine, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, what's, what's in okay, there? Okay, cool, right. As a base, uh, this is the same base I always use for all my stick mixes. I'm using Fusion at the moment. Right, so it's chop boily. Yeah, it's chop boily, uh, right. just um, in the blender, blitzed for probably a couple of minutes just to get it down really nice and fine. As you can see, there's no big bits left in there. Yep. Any big bits, you're going to risk impaling your hook point Absolutely. when you put it into the sticks. So there's only some really tiny, small little pieces in there. The rest of it is basically just crumb. And that almost always forms the basis of whatever stick mix I'm making, whether I'm using Cell, Fusion, Activate, anything. Always so whatever there. boiler you're putting in, yep. you're crumbing that up as you yep, base exactly. Your That's mix. the base for my stick. Right, and what um, goes in next? Next thing uh, is tuna. <gasps> I've never used that before. No, you wouldn't. Radical. <laughs> <laughs> um, tuna with the brine as well, obviously, because you've got the salt and all the attraction from the tuna. Yep. So that goes in there as well. Go on in, so that in there. I'm not going to put the whole can in because I'm not making that much. I don't want it to be right. too wet. Okay. So I'm probably going to put about half the can in there, like right. that. Out of the way. Uh, next, uh, I don't, do you want to get your nose around that? Oh, mate. <laughs> oh. That, that's like toe jam, it, that smells, that is minging. What is it? It's horrendous. It's, uh, it, it's a product, it's an oriental product called um, called Balacam. It's kind of been on the secret list for, for I've been using it for about probably 10 or 12 years, right. but it is actually commercially available now through through some carp fishing companies. It's just basically uh, fermented shrimp um, it, in block form. It's really salty, uh, incredibly strong, right. really, really strong. Um, so obviously you What's get it really used for then potent. normally? It's actually a cooking ingredient, believe right. it or not, as bad as it smells. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's kind of quite sort of pasty, it's really hard. So I just use a little grater, bring a little grater with me, right. and I just grate it in like that. And it just grates in perfectly. Jamie Oliver, eat your heart out. So that goes in there. And this also helps, <sighs> helps form the help form the salt content in my steak mix. Right. Like yourself, place a lot of faith in adding salt to my baits. Mm. So if, there, if there was smell of vision um, ladies and gentlemen, you'd you would not be, be happy. Oh, gagging like me, that's, that's minging. So that's in there. And then the last thing is the fusion liquid, which right. just complements everything. Cool. And that's the, uh, is that the dip or the, or the neat stuff for the boiling? No, this is the dip. The dip. Yeah. Right, okay, and just cool. uh, a little bit of that. I can always put some more in afterwards. Obviously, you don't want to make it too wet to start off with, so start low with any liquids. And then right. it's just you a want, case of getting your hands in. And, no, I like to no. use my hands so, right, I can, okay. Go on then. so I can actually Get it blend in there. it. All that chin, all those big lumps, make sure you break them all up. And when, when and would you and in. when wouldn't you use a stick mix? Um, I like fishing sticks. I mean, a lot of my fishing is, is, is sort of done over boily, and I actually tend to use sticks often more as a kind of anti-tangle measure than, yep. than sort of anything else. Because um, obviously they're, they're perfect for that, um, stopping your hair tongue. You don't have to, you don't have to tie your rings and things up with PVA, anything yep. like that. You just pop on a little stick, and it just gives you that extra tiny little bit of concentrated scent around your rig. So you, do, you, do you have that on more often than not, or? Uh, uh, I would probably say maybe maybe 50, 50, 50. Right. Something and like that. And when wouldn't you use it then, just so people Kind know. of when I'm using it, I, I, I still like using stringers. Good right. old, uh, <laughs> good old stringer. Um, especially when I'm boilie fishing, like using 18s and spreads of boilies, I'll just, I'll probably fish a T-bait stringer. Right. Um, but the, the situation that I've been in here, I'm fishing at really, really long range, 130, 140 yards. Um, so I've been using the long chuck funnel web, just yep. a really small one, any maybe inch and a half, maybe yep. something like that. And, and it's just to stop tangles really is, is the main key. So that's, that's, that's pretty much done. It's nicely blended. Look at that, that's you can see, and it And it smells incredibly strong. It's a really, really yeah. potent little mix. Cool, yeah. Because of the balacan. Yeah, very nice. Um, so you just got a beautiful little pile yeah. of and how long will that last? Stink. How long will it last before you? Out right, in the water. Well, no. It, it, how long oh, would sorry, you use on the it bank. for? When, when, how long um, does it take to go off? I, I'd, I'd, I'd probably make. Well, I, um, I'd probably make it fresh every, every two days, maybe. Yeah. Right. I certainly wouldn't want to leave it any longer than that because the, because the tuna. But again, it depends on the weather. If it's baking hot, I might even make it fresh every day. Right. Just, just for, yeah. just for confidence. Yeah, I found the same in the summertime. If you're using fresh fish, yeah, it loses its potency. It does. It's, yeah. it's, it dries out and yeah. it doesn't seem to have the attraction. Yeah. After 24 hours, you know. So that's mine. Right. You're going to show me yours. Yep. Right. Now give us uh, some of them hook baits first of all, because that's what I'm going to start off by doing. Um, is dousing a few of those up. Been doing this for quite a while. <clears throat> these little hook baits, just a few of them into a bag because they're gonna, what I'm gonna put on them will make them 
sort of go off, maybe not even as many as that, depends how many bites you want yep. to get in your session. <laughs> and then before, rather than pouring that lovely juice out of the way, that mm. goes into there and soak them in like that. They're brilliant anyway, as yeah, a hook bait. Yeah, They're brilliant yeah. anyway, but that's that, a new one for me. That I that must admit, just wash, just soaks into them and just just adds to it. And I yep. actually I don't like using a lot of juice in my stick mix. So I'll just pour that other bit away um, because I don't want it to go too soft, and I don't want my pellets to go all mushy. Yep. Um, I'm a bit posher than you. I use fork, <laughs> mate. Right, so we just smash that up in there again in brine because. Uh, I found in the summertime the stuff in oil works brilliantly, but in the yeah, winter yeah, time definitely. I've yeah. done a lot of stick mix fishing. It just doesn't seem to be the one in the winter. No. So, yeah, and I, I do do a lot of fishing with sticks in the winter, just as singles, you know. Um, then a little bit of Tabasco going in there. That or powdered chili, um, both are excellent. But I just think because this is already fluid, yep. it dissolves in the water a little yeah. bit better, you know. So mix that up. The other thing we put in the chilli in there is it turns it pink and it makes it look like using salmon rather than tuna as well. So that's <laughs> another little... It's amazing how many sort of what I would call pressured syndicate waters. No one uses things like this because it's no, uncool, no. isn't it? Yeah, it's uncool totally, to use PVA. Yep. Um, and then a bit of salt in as well. Yeah, you can't go wrong with Just to uh, enhance the flavour. Mix that round all together. Out there. I mean, I've done well on all sorts of bits and bobs in my stick mixes. In the winter, I've done really well with uh, using liquidised bread. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. Done, done, done really well on that. Um, I'm not sure whether it's uh, any small ones because it's quite blatant on the bottom because it's bright Spreads white. Spreads a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, so you, you know you've got almost like a palm-sized white patch, but it's with a little bait in the middle. Mm. Done really well on that Wicked. in the winter. Uh, right, a few pellets. Just uh, the two mil bloodworm pellets that. I've rated so highly for a while because we've seen a fish's reaction to them on the underwater film. And that's why there's not too much juice in there because after a few hours they soak it up and it becomes, yeah. I want it to be loads of little bits. Yeah. I don't want it to be Most one solid mass. lump, you know? Yeah. So whack a few more of those in there, I think. It's just really combining all the things that um, I've caught fish on in the past, you yeah. know? Um, and then some ground bait. Um, there's loads of different ground baits you can use. I've used the mainline ones, they're fishy ones, very good. This is Hinder's Blitz, very, very oily. Yeah. A few little tiny pellets in there as well. Um, and Mr. Pennings had a very good reaction to this in his garden pond, so. <laughs> so, uh, so, I mean, really, the, the, the main bulk of that is tuna, isn't it? Yeah, I would really? say it's probably 50% probably of it, yeah. yeah. And it's, it just, you can see that it just goes nice and flaky. You know, it's not one stodgy lump. Yeah. Um, as ground bait, it's going to sort of form straight, almost straight away. But you could use that almost instantly. I like it to soak in for a few hours, yep. to be honest, and yep. let some of the goodness from the tuna soak into the other bits. Um, but that is is basically it. Just so you know, ladies and gentlemen, we've colour coded everything now. The systems have been updated, so they're a nice carpy green colour. And can you see there? We've got red and red. That's for your long chuck system, available in five metres and 20 metres as a refill. And then for your boily funnel web, which is what I'm using on the smaller venues here, just a little bit easier to work with, green and green. And you want the hex mesh if you're using sticks because the holes are bigger so it's easier to get a stick needle through it. So that is stick mixes. There's no reason to not use them. They stop the rig tangling, they keep the hook away from any weed or anything on the bottom and they get you loads more bites. <sighs> Look at that, 50 pound, one ounces, a beautiful big mirror carp. Absolutely beautiful fish, immaculately proportioned. I don't know if you can see, but my nookie mat's actually frozen solid. It's really, really cold tonight. Difficult conditions, big moon, clear. But they're still well on the bait. I put out another big portion of fusion this afternoon. And this was from the one right smack bang in the middle of it. The little snowman set up with a little yellow one again has done the business. Been messing around with the uh, with the new hooks. A bit of practice for my fishing back home, and uh, so far they're doing me proud. <sighs> Beautiful. There we have it. Forty-four pounds, ten ounces of common carp, taken with a cell boilie, tipped with a little bright bait, and big carp love bright boilies. So when I get this baby back. Me and Gaz are going to show you how to knock up some little homemade specials. Superb. I 
I think, mate, I'm sure you'd agree, if I had to put my life uh, to catch a carp, put my life on the line any day, it, it would have to be one of those, without a doubt. If we had smell a vision here, right, <laughs> I would have to describe these to you as one of the finest smelling pineapple babies on the planet. They are absolutely luxurious. And then what we're going to do here is to show you not only the process of making them initially, but the sort of time and TLC we put into them afterwards to make them extra special. Because it's not just what you do today, it's what you do for, well, months afterwards, really, to just keep oh, yeah. priming them. Yeah, they're rolled with love and a bit of TLC, aren't they? Yeah, and then we, we keep priming them afterwards. So we're going to take you through the process of how to knock up your own specials and then how to prepare them afterwards as well and keep them ripe, as we call it. So, right, mate, let's uh, let's crack on. First one there. Talk me through the, well, talk me through the flavour, mate. Pineapple. I, I mean, I don't know how many carp have been caught on this? Literally, literally thousands and thousands and thousands of carp have yeah. been caught on pineapple. You just... For whatever reason, I don't know why, it just works. It just works everywhere. It's a phenomenal flavour. It is, mate. It um, is. It, it's just a, a, a complete banker and something yeah. that you've always kind of got to have on one rod at least, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. And what, what we'll show you as well is the fact that you can actually um, put quite a bit in one mix um, because of its sort of the, the nature of the bait. It's not very acidic, the, the flavour, so you can get away with using a lot in a couple of egg mix. So what we'll do first, mate, let's crack the egg. One in, one of nature's finest. Oh, beautiful. I won't put my finger it in makes, there, It um, <laughs> makes a big difference, don't know about you, but I'm, I'm really fussy about using absolutely fresh eggs. Yeah, well, it, it does make a difference, mate. A lot Definitely. of people like to use um, just the egg white, yeah. um, but because of what we do with the bait afterwards, I think it's better to use the egg yolk as well because it, it gives the bait a slightly softer nature because we dry them out for such a long period of time having the egg yolk in there as well. Changes uh, the consistency. Yeah, it does, it? it does. They don't go like complete biscuits, no. which means when you do cast them out, uh, once they take on water, they go on like little bits of mush. Yeah. This way, keeps stays very consistent and takes on flavour much better. So give them a whisk, mate. Right, that looks like the eggs are pretty much whisked up, mate. Now for the uh, colour and the flavour. Personally, I don't know about you, but I mean, I know on the, on the tub, it says to put a quarter of a teaspoon in for four eggs. Now, I like my baits to be really, really bright, as bright as I can possibly yeah. make them. And I find if you only put a quarter of a teaspoon in, they're just not bright enough. So I put I put a full teaspoon, full heap teaspoon, in a one egg mix. Right. So we've got two yeah, eggs in here. Me, mate. So just, just hold them in. There we go. Give that a little. Have a look at that. It's a lot of dye to, uh, to a couple of eggs, but trust me, it will work for you. So we'll just uh, stir them in. Beautiful. I think that's pretty much done, isn't it, mate? Yeah, they look like... All those extra little bits will mix in anyway. When yeah, you start they come to... like paste. Yeah, you can see them, a few little lumps of dye, but they'll soon uh, dissipate into the uh, into the base mix. Get some flavour in. Now for the deadly pineapple. The pineapple, as uh, it become renowned for up our way. Pepet for you here, mate. Right, so what we're going to do is we're going to go for, I believe that's a three mil pepet. Right. Oh, squeeze that out. Come on, baby. There she is. That's three. So we're going to basically put three of these in. So we've got nine mil and then maybe another mil on top. So 10 mil of pineapple flavour is going to go in there. Right, here's the first pepet full of, uh, of the three and one mil that we're going to put in. Lovely. Okay. For pet number two. So that's six mil. Six mil. Here's for pet number three. And all we're going to do is one more mil into this pipette. Okay. There we go. There's the final pipette. Okay. Um, give that a whisk, Gaz, and then uh, if you can get me the uh, the wonderful sweet aid. Steve Morgan, the main man at Mainline, along with Kevin, little Steve, they've told me a lot about the, the levels of sweeteners I, sh I should use in my single look baits. And um, with this wonderful little one, it's, a, it's, it's an aid. It's, a, it's, it's cut on a, a type of flavour called an aid. And it's a sweetener, and he's recommended using two mil to every five mil of uh, flavour. Yep. So that's what we're going to do here. Because we've got 10 mil in there, I'm going to put four mil of sweetener in. There's the first two mil. 
So in that goes. And there's the. And there's the final two mil again. So that's four mil, four mil of sweetener, which is the sweet aid. That's not as strong as sort of intense sweetener and some of the sort of smaller, more potent ones. It's a more rounded smell, um, beautiful. It really gives that, that whole bait a rounded aroma as it leaves the bait. So we've got 10 mil of flavor in there, which is the pineapple, the profile plus one, and then four mil of sweetener. That, you'd put that's your life on that for a bite. I you? would put my life on that. Okay. This is the uh, Polaris pop-up mix, which is the one we all use for our single look baits. Very, very buoyant. Lovely, lovely, but well, lovely base mix. Gaz is uh, polluting it with uh, yellow dye. So as he puts it in, you can do this on your own, but obviously it's nice to have your little wolf-looking assistant with you. <laughs> <laughs> you should show him your hair, Gaz, <laughs> under that hat, mate. <laughs> Well, Gaz, I mean, I know in a lot of your fishing, mate, you're always using these um, singles to sort of tip off a food bait. Yeah, yeah. Um, sort of talk me I through mean, the presentation and, and, and sort of how you set it up, because I know you talk about the wide gapes and all that, but no, no one's got a clue how you set it up. Yeah, I, sp I mean, um, just I, I suppose to go back briefly to why I actually use them, um, even, I mean, a, a lot of the fishing I've done for the last probably four or five years has been almost purely over boily. Um, and even when I'm using uh, a lot of boily, I've still found I've always done better on a hook bait that's been tipped with a little, a little bright one. Uh, and I'm just, I'm convinced that, that if, if, if the carp aren't feeding quite as heavily over a baited area, you've still got a chance of that hook bait getting picked up because you've got yeah. the little bright one on the top and you've got the extra bit of sand. You'll still catch fish if, um, if, if they're feeding really heavily on the area, but well, I think you just get those extra few chances yeah. when they're not quite having it. It's of like course. a little sight, you know, they'll come in, they'll be browsing, they'll spot the little bit of yellow and, and they're there. What's the step by step? What, what's the, uh, you know, if you, if you were to describe how you set it up, what's the first thing you do when you tie that rig up? Uh, I put my hook bait on. Yeah. What, tie loop, loop in the, the hook link. Yeah. yeah, loop in the end. Um, put my first bait on, put the little pop up on, then put either a, probably a, a 14, or an 18 mil bottom bait on underneath that. And that's just gonna sit nicely. It's not gonna be overly buoyant. You don't want it wafting around all over the swim, especially when there's big carp in there feeding. Yeah. So it's gonna be on the deck, but it's still gonna be buoyant. So it's basically just taking the weight of the hook and the hook link out of the equations. So it's just making it act more naturally. Okay, then what so do you do next? That's the bait on. Then I'll thread on uh, a small ring, a little micro rig ring. Right, yep. One of the really tiny ones. The non-reflective ones. Yeah. The non-reflective ones. Very important, according to Simon Scott, that is. Uh, yeah. I, will, I will tie it on, overhand knot, and then most importantly, um, I'll tie a second overhand knot, and that just locks it, and if you tighten it, it kicks the ring off perfectly at a right angle to the hook link. Right, okay. Yep, and Where that, do you position that on the on the, uh, on the the hook? Uh, just as, as far around the bend as as I can before it actually pops around. Right, okay. Yep, so, so all the way around. So once that's on, set the length of my hair, uh, knotless knot as normal. Yep. Back through the eye, and then uh, the uh, ever faithful little shrink tube kicker. Right, how, how long's that piece of shrink tube? Uh, probably, well, it's three quarters of an inch, maybe. I've, I have used it at various, I've used quite long ones, probably like up to sort of an inch or so at times. And I've also used little short ones. Um, and to be perfectly honest, I haven't still decided which I think is is best. Well, you seem to do well on everything, mate. So That's well. the thing, I mean, that rig, I mean, I've, I went through a spell for a couple of years where I was on something like 50 or 60 bites without a dropped fish, not one hook pull yeah. out of 50 or 60 bites. And, and that, you know, when you're fishing for big fish, you just can't afford to be losing them. Yeah. Uh, so it's just, it's so, f <laughs> <laughs> it's so faithful. Um, you know, I've just got so much confidence in it. I'll take yeah. it anyway. Brilliant, mate. Well, hopefully that's given people a little idea of how to um, put that rig together and obviously make, uh, make good use of these uh, hook baits that we're going to put together. One thing I will say before we start, obviously when you when you take a pinch of mix off, obviously it's all rough and torn and you've got all the little cracks and things like that in it. And if you try and roll that into a ball straight away, I'll just show you, you'll end up with cracks and 
things, which once it's boiled is not going to help at all because the water's going to get in there quicker and it's going to affect the buoyancy. So when you take your pinch off, roll it really firmly between your fingers and then slowly bring it up into a ball from there. Yeah, one of the other little tips I'll give you, um, <laughs> because last night um, we had a fair bit of paste, um, I had Mr. Mr. F, Danny Fairbrass, sit down with me and um, we're rolling some uh, little specials for his syndicate um, where he likes to use um, two bits of plastic corn and uh, he saw he spied a few in my little tub um, which are basically like this you just make a little round round ball just like that okay and then with one finger just push it down you end up with like a little like a bit of sweet corn in effect and then two of them yeah Perfect, mate. If you want to, uh, if you want to fish two of them on a KD, or, or yeah. like Dan does on the wide gate or, or, with the little ring. Yeah, or you just want to tip off a little dumbbell. Yeah, it's a perfect, perfect size little uh, yeah, little just... bait. Well, as you can see, me and my uh, trusted assistant Gareth Ferrum have uh, knocked up well over a tub full of bait. Um, Gaz is uh, taking the shortcut and rolled donkey chokers like that, while I've been putting all the effort in. You always need a few big ones. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, you catch big carp, I catch oh, yeah. little. But a little total course fishing cup. <laughs> That's it, yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Um, so we're going to put these on the boil. I'm just filling up a palmful. Like to do them not too many at a time because. Yeah. Uh, It'll take it off the boil. Yeah. Run the board as consistently. Right. So there's a there's a little handful there. There we go, mate. Yeah. There we go. And then we're going to boil them for 90 seconds exactly. So I'm on the stopwatch. Ready? Yeah. Oh, one's gone in. There we go. Here and we there go. go. Lovely. So we'll just boil them up. Um, it's worth saying, basically, this is the process now. Gaz, have you got the, the little bag on the side of the ones we've done last night? I have. Yeah, there we go. So while they're boiling, this is what, what I knocked up with Dan last night, and a little little air dry bag, which is absolutely perfect. Just been hanging them off the bivy door. Um, what I do is one, once these are done, we lay them on a towel um, to let them dry off, and then I transfer them into this bag. And then we'll probably keep about, what, two weeks? 10 days, two weeks? Yeah, I dry mine for about 10 days to two weeks. Don't leave them in the sunlight. No. I think that, that can deteriorate the eggs. If you leave them somewhere dry, let them cool down, they'll go They'll go like little biscuits, and then this is where the little secret edge comes in. Guys, just roll them around, take the air. Uh, Spread them out. Make sure they're not touching each other when they're drying as well, so they dry nice and evenly without any damp patches on them. Right, well now, for our little secret edge, which is all in there. This is what plays the biggest part in our results with single look baits. In there, I've got 100 mil of uh, Profile Plus Pineapple and then 40 mil of Sweet Aid. That's basically the same ratio that I put in the two egg mix earlier, which is uh, two to five. So 100 mil, 40 mil of the Sweet Aid. That gives you the perfect levels. And Gaz, I'm gonna let you explain exactly what that achieves afterwards. Okay, right. So what you've got, once like we explained before about drying your baits, after sort of 10, 12 days, maybe two weeks, once you've dried your baits out thoroughly, so all the moisture has gone out of the baits, um, they're, they're ready to take this on. And what I do is I'll put them in the tub that they're gonna stay in, and just put a couple of mil, literally, and just a tiny little dribble. Not soak them in it, because it just doesn't have the same effect. A couple of mil, give them a good shake, so they're really, really lightly coated. Um, and then after probably another three or four days, because the baits are so dry, it basically starts to rehydrate them, so they take all that flavor back into them. Um, and then after another three or four days, a little bit more on, give them a shake again and let them dry. Yeah. And I'll keep doing that to, to rehydrate them with this flavour. And that really is the key is, mate. To, to why they work so well. Can't believe we've actually told a quarter of a million people our favourite little edge. Um, but but it is, it is worldy. We've used it for over 10 years now, that, that, that little sort of combination and, and tactic. Yeah, exactly. And it's been superb. Um, but before we sign off, mate, I'm going to uh, make you sort of let a few more people know a couple of favourite combos. Um, Scopex and Peach uh, has got to be uh, another one, absolute winners that I'd take anywhere in the country. Absolute classic. Uh, Scopex response with mainline Peach Aid. Yeah. Um, absolute winner. Being a winner, yeah. being a winner. Fra Frank Warwick's uh, yeah. mentioned yeah, yeah, yeah. that a few times to us as a combination. That's been superb. And um, I suppose one of my other little favourites would be the response Tangerine and the response Blackcurrant. Again, that citrus 
and berry combination is uh, is a very very big one it's been so so good for us yeah um well that's it that's pop-ups that's how you put the singles together it's done us proud for a long long time not only are the food baits played a big part in our bait but also the the tipping off of a single with a snowman effort with the the high vis baits it's been brilliant it's worked for us and it'll do the same for you so get on it now oh, she is 41 pound 10 ounces of beautiful big boil eating mirror look at the gut on that it's been out there eating my fusion a little yellow one did the job a tiny little stick using really potent little sticks fishing at really big range to get out to where the fish are so using a tiny little stick a little ib over a big bed of fusion and hemp it certainly did the job with this one Ah, oh, what a result. Nice and early in the trip. 34 pounds, three ounces of Pirouette Mirror Carp. Taken on the KD rig, which is probably my favorite rig at the moment. I've been using it for two years now with great success. And I think we're gonna show you how to tie it later on. Perfect. We're going to talk rigs now and we're going to look at two very specialist rigs which have been doing the damage up and down the country. Um, Mr Hamidi here has had quite a lot of big ones on him and uh, he's been using them a lot longer than I have so we're going to pick his brains on um, how they work and how you set them up. So first of all the one with the little yellow pop up there, um, what's that one? It's now uh, become known as the KD rig so uh, we've, we've been using it I'd say for about two years. Um, it, it all started really when, when the curve hook samples arrived in the office. Right, so talk us through, you tie the, yeah. tie the loop for the hair first. Yeah. Yep, loop yeah. of the hair. Then the bait goes on? Bait goes on, and right. then what you've got to do, you want to line it up so that the, the bend of the hook is touching the, uh, the top of the boilie. Okay. It, that's, that's the length of your hair. Okay. okay. Cool. The only recommendation I'd make is if you're fishing for smaller fish, you can shorten that slightly, like doubles, okay, because right, okay. they might have smaller mouths. Yep. And, and then for bigger fish, you can lengthen it a little bit, maybe half an inch. Um, so once you've got that set, you, you start the knotless knot as you usually would. So back through the back of the eye, yep. twice round at the top of the hair, and then five times underneath. And then right, so two, two normal whips, yep. pull the hair back out of the way, yep. and then carry on whipping down the hook, and exactly. then back through the eye as you exactly. would do normally. So it's the knotless knot, but the hair's coming out the, the, the eye end of the knot rather it, than the shank end of the exactly. knot. Exactly, and right. that, that is basically where the science of that rig starts, which is um, because you're using a lighter bait, yep. I always say if you put a light bait anywhere near the bend of the hook, you're adding a life jacket to the best part of your hook. So, yes. you, so you're lifting it out of the, the, you know, the bottom lip of the, of the fish. Absolutely. So if you now reverse that yep. and put a lighter bait off what is already the lightest part of the hook, which is the eye, yep. um, you're then adding a life jacket to already a lightest part. So it's now lifting that back end up. So it's trying to attack the bottom lip as it goes in. So the, 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 the eye's getting light, the point's then getting heavy. Exactly. That's how it's yeah, going. yeah, you're, right. you're adding more emphasis to that end. Right. So um, the, the same way as a bottom bait would make the hook turn in your hand on the bank, yep. in water, that does the same principle. On the bank, it will never turn in the palm of your hand. Yep. You might get one out of 10 or whatever, but yeah, yeah. That's, not the, that's not the important part. It's the fact that once it's in water, that, that, that mechanics, you know, if you hold that bait up, look, that's how it's gonna behave in water. But as right. it as it lifts in, yep. that's going to be hanging down, and that's yep. that's that's the effect you're having. And the I, point's going to yeah, be yeah. pricking the flesh straight away. Exactly, and I think that's why it causes them problems. There's a good bit of separation from the hook, the shots there, and and the the, the point is hanging so lazily that I think a lot of fish have been used to quite a tight hair. Um, pop-ups coming off at different areas. I think it's just causing them more problems than they've been they're used. Not, they're not used to dealing e with exactly. it. Exactly. It obviously works perfect with the curved shank hook. That's um, the pattern to use with it. Right. That is okay. got, it's got to be one of these. I mean, you can use it with wide gapes and, and bits and bits, but I've found the hook holds and, and the fish we've caught on this trip and other trips have been brilliant with the curve they shank. They have been, yeah, yeah. They have been. So a hybrid soft hook link. Yeah. Um, what's that? Eight yeah. inch, something like that? Yeah, because a lot of my fishing's done over boilies. Yeah. Um, I've been using it with sort of eight to 10 inches and then right. a, a, a five turn grinner to a link loop. Right. Um, just using a clay coloured safe zone tail rubber there. Just to and cover that up. Exactly, and then link loop onto the stick clip, push it over, job's done, that's ready to go. 
and you skirted over something there that probably was double dutch to a lot of people you went oh yeah because i'm using boilies i'm using eight to ten inch hook links yeah like, yeah <laughs> why why are you using longer hook links right well we've done a lot of filming together and i've you know we watch fish feed over particles and they feed very very slowly don't they, they so do. so it takes so long for them to hit hit the lead and 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 the hook mechanics to to work it's the opposite with boilies because fish are moving very quickly they're, they're picking at baits and and generally it's very difficult to put load of boilies in a four in foot a, square of a catapult yeah. yeah so because you've got them picking and and that's that's a method i found very successful this year i felt that a short short hookling could probably cost you fish because that they're, they're moving at such a pace and if it's if not going to go in their mouth properly yeah if they come in and you know go down on one and it's just like oh it's not quite gone in where with a longer link i feel like they suck it it's behaving naturally especially with a balanced bait it's flying in their mouth yeah. they move away to the next one and then bang, bang you've got them yeah right. that's and i noticed there you're talking about bang lead systems you've got an inline there to drop off on the bite yeah um when when would you fish it and when wouldn't you fish it well that obviously that that sort of effect of the, the fish shaking their head and and the weight going away from the, the pressure if you like yeah um it is really, really important for me. You know, I've watched that footage again and I've just felt it's, it's a must have in any rig that I use. Um, that particular drop off system, yeah. I use generally on weedy lakes. The, the, right. the lake I fished last year was really, really chockable weed. Right. So a lot of people on there using like helicopter rigs and leg clips and every fight was a proper tussle. They're in the boat. I, I didn't get in the boat once. I didn't right. even get, I think. Because the lead was coming off on the bottom. Straight away, on the surface, fish is shooting up to the top. Yep. You know, you're locked up as well. They're coming up, straight in the net, no no problems. Right, okay. and, and that was down to the lead system and nothing else. Right. So... Okay, so yeah. in, in those kind of situations, yeah. weedy situation, it's worth dumping the lead. Obviously, you know, we don't want to be dumping the lead every single time. Exactly. You don't want to be littering the lake with yeah. with, with leads. But in, it's better to lose the lead than lose everything yeah. and the fish as well. Exactly. Basically. Would you rather... Right. Would it cost you a quid to land every fish you, you hook? You know, you'd pay it, wouldn't you? You would so, pay it. Yeah, would, in them situations, definitely. And this other one... Um, talk to us about that because you can't, you can't really take any credit for that one, can you? I can't take any credit for that one. That is from the Dove from above, Tom Dove, who um, has very quickly established himself as a top, top angler. He is. And um, talk to him a lot because we're always fishing and, and I chat to him on the phone. And he, he was using that Walthamstow. Um, last year when you were fishing together, we were on the same bait. Yeah, he didn't tell me. No. Nah. <laughs> he didn't tell me when he was using it. Yeah. But, <laughs> but what, what I liked about that, again, he was trying to make a boily behave you know like a balanced bait again yep. um didn't want the hook adding any more weight to the boilie the bottom bait yep. didn't want to use a fluoro or anything so he was adjusting the weight of his his standard right. bait so how, how have you done that then you've drilled that out I'll yeah you drill it three quarters through yep. so not right the way through yep. okay you then cut a piece of cork the same length as the boilie okay right. so when you finally push it into the bait a tiny bit's protruding from the end okay okay you then you, you've made the loop on your hair yep. you slide the bait on so that it normally a cork plug's going that way and the hair could just cuts through it this time the boy the hair is going right through the, the cylinder the cork, yeah right. okay. um and exactly like the kd you hold the cork against the bend of the hook yep. with, and then um that's the length of your hair yep. and then tie it exactly the same way as the kd style which is two turns above five turns below yeah um and then Finish it off with a f five turn grin into a link loop, and yep. that's it. What what you then have to do is obviously different cork from different companies going to behave differently. So it's going to be more or less buoyant. Exactly. Right, okay. So you've got to test it in the margins. You go yep. down, put it in, and, and the effect you're trying to look for is it almost like what that's doing there. That that boilie is trying to sit up on the cork. Yep. Hence why it's called the muzzer because right. it looks like a button mushroom. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, what it does, it just kicks the eye up ever so slightly. Right. And, uh, which puts the point down puts the point down so as soon as it goes in the fish's mouth it's going in like that right suck it in and it's going in straight you know eye up point down Perfect. and again causing problems it's got tom loads of fish it's caught me loads of fish this year um it hasn't caught me anything because no one's actually shown yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah for boily fishing yeah. again for when you're not Looks looking pucker, mate. yeah pucker. it is deadly and and it's worked really well and then the lead system there, um, another one great for fishing. Over, well, it's great full stop, the yeah. shocker rig. Yep. Um, Let's just hold that up just yep. so everyone can see yep. it. Yeah, no worries. Quickly save some leader. Yep, exactly. Sh shock bead on the end of it, cut the swivel off and, and put- Took a, your advice yeah, there. Put a quick link on there just to neaten it up. It's all got to look neat and tidy. Exactly. And then your backstop, so when the fish moves off, bang. bang. So you can imagine over a big spread of boilies, they're, they're moving merrily, picking yeah, yeah. them up and wallop. 
the, the hooks in and uh, you've got another carp on the bank. Wicked, wicked. Well, that's a very, very interesting um, look into Ali's rigs and how to fish over boilies. Add that into your own fishing and I'm sure you'll be putting more fish on the bank. Oh. And there you go. 36 pounds, six ounces, nailed on the KD rig. And if that's not enough to convince you to get on the curve shank hooks and that KD rig, then nothing is. Absolutely stunning carp. Pucker. Have a look at this baby, 40 pounds, four ounces of early morning caught carp. Absolutely made up with this one. Just goes to show when you get your baiting right, your methods right, it all falls into place and carp like this and hits like this are possible for all of you. Really, really happy. Just going to slip him back now and hopefully catch another one. Superb.